All right, so where we are in the process so far in these demos is I sketched out a vision for how I would showcase a transformation over a short animation. And I storyboarded it thinking about how does it start? How does that change going into the middle? How does that uh, end and finish going to the end in such a way that it, it is set to be able to reset to the beginning? And there's a bunch of ways you can do that. I'm just trying to avoid a jump cut from this to this, right? So I then use those storyboard sketches to build my keyframes and create an animation that moves between all of those beginning, middle, and end sequences. And this animation uh, using GIF Maker, I should probably open that up. Because I'm going to show you the differences between Photoshop and GIFMaker.me, right? But using GIFMaker.me, I'm able to bring in the flattened keyframes and then set each of them to a certain timing. So I used 500 milliseconds, which is two frames per second for this initial animation. And I, I uh, repeated some frames. You'll see how I kind of, to, to lengthen the time, because I wanted a little bit more time in the sun and a little bit more time frozen. And still, by the end of class posting it, it does the job. It meets all the requirements. And I even think it's fairly engaging but it just didn't feel fully satisfying to me. So a lot of animation is, is refining it. And I did not add any new assets and I did not make any new keyframes. Instead, I simply took longer <laughs> um, with gifmaker.me to build the animation and time it differently. So if I want to extend a moment like that, where he's frozen, I have to just add a bunch of the same frame into gifmaker.me because all of those frames, I, I switched it to being um, 300 milliseconds. So roughly a third of a second. So three frames per second. And so if I want to do it for, I think I have a pause for three seconds there. I had to do, nine nine identical keyframes in order right but this way you know he looks like he's kind of breathing in breathing out and then i did play with the opacity a little bit going between keyframes so even though they're the exact same keyframe it, it blends it and blurs it a little bit and so you'll see when he starts to melt there's a little bit of a motion blur right there which is just adding a frame that's 50% opacity over the frame before it. So again, not creating any new keyframes or in any new assets, but, but layering the ones you have maybe a little differently. So there's, there's editing involved, but this ends up being about 50 frames of animation rather than 20 for just subtle differences in timing. But I am happier with this. So the refined storyboard though, that project continues. And so I'm gonna open that up in PhotoP. You can see how I've started it. And what's nice about a refined storyboard is it doesn't matter, the subtlety of your timing doesn't matter at all because this becomes just sequential images. And so sometimes you jump quite a bit in your telling of it. So I'm gonna open that in PhotoP. And I haven't talked about organizing your files in a while, but hopefully you see as we're starting to build lots and lots of assets and things, it's very helpful to know where to find your stuff. So if everything is just stuck in your downloads folder, take the time to organize it into different assignments. It's important, especially as we get close to our midterm uh, critique, where you're gonna pick three of your assignments to post. So 
let's see. So I have my storyboard there in my assignment five folder. Opening it in photo P. And there we go. So we have some more space. All right. So I am on my sixth keyframe. And I need to be searching my keyframe folders. And what I actually brought in for, for my sixth keyframe was number seven. So as you bring in, this is another important reason to label your keyframes. As you bring them in to PhotoP or to Photoshop, you'll see that the name of the file becomes the name of the layer asset. So now I want to start thawing my creature out. And I want to end it in a way that sets it up for the beginning. Somewhat, right? So I actually think these three panels, 7B, 7C, and 8, are pretty good for showing the melting of the snow or of, of the ice. And that this is a good last panel to tell the end of the story. Because your refined storyboard should not start and stop with the same image. That's just repetitive information. Even though I did create these extra panels to help it reset a little bit more smoothly in the animation. So I'm going to bring in each of these very quickly. And I have that added problem, right, of cropping it after the fact just a little bit. So I'm using my guides, centering it on that middle box. Because also little camera moves don't matter so much in a refined storyboard as they do in an animation where it's moving, but it does matter a lot that you have equal space and equal formatting between each of these panels. So it looks nice and clean. And so the formatting reads as a sequence of images rather than just kind of a scrapbook of images. So I've cleaned it up in the middle. Now I can move it down and nest it into its place. And I'm going to go over the storyboarding thing uh, all over again. I'm going to show you uh, a quick animation, I think using Photoshop, and then just review all these things for you again. And just show you some of the, the advantages that the Photoshop timeline tool has over gifmaker.me. Okay, so next I'm going to bring this one in. Well, actually, let me see. Because those two are not that different. So I might go this one, this one, this one. Yeah, I think that's going to make more sense. Hmm. No, I go back to my original because I like how the creature is more revealed in 7C. Now, where did 7C go? Oh, it's up there. So a lot of uh, storytelling is trying to figure out what you want your audience to pay attention to. And when you have lots of different elements being animated, like the sky, the color, the ice, that's where character becomes really important. I'm telling this story through my my Psyduck character. So even if the ice doesn't seem like it changes a whole lot, there is a pretty big difference in how clear and how warm the character looks here than here. And that, I think, helps tell the story I want to tell of the ice thawing. But you make those own distinctions for your own keyframes and your own refined storyboard. So what makes the best project when we turn them in today? 
you want your storyboard to communicate, your refined storyboard to communicate the story, and you want your animation to communicate the story. But they're going to do it with different tools, and they're going to have different strengths. Yeah, and I think I want to go to here. Okay, so as I bring in my final refined storyboard frame, and I rasterize it so I can cut it down, I want you to remember the resolutions we used. Because it would be a shame to do all of this formatting and then not have something at a print resolution. So our animation, all of our animations are square and they're made for screen resolution. So the, the highest uh, pixels per inch that I require for it is 150. And if you need to, you can go down to 72, which is standard screen resolution. And this, the physical size is eight by eight inches. So each of these is eight by eight inches by 150 pixels per inch. But when you put them all together, then we're keeping it at 150 pixels per inch, but we're putting it onto a field, a canvas size that is 30 inches by 40 inches. Now, because of that, if I resample it, so I go image size, or I'm sorry, if I don't resample it, and I change the pixels per inch from 72 or 150, you know, the screen resolutions we're using, to a print resolution of 300, which is standard print resolution, then the size is going to change as well. So 30 to 30 inches by 40 inches becomes 14 inches by 19 inches, right? Which is a nice print size. And that doesn't actually change anything. So I said, okay, it didn't change a single pixel. But what it changes is the physical format, the physical size of the paper. And now this is a really nice size to make a full quality printout. So then when I save it, I'm going to first save it as a PSD. And I have named this already in assignment five as my storyboard, my refined storyboard. So it keeps that name. So I've updated that. Now I'm going to save it or and export it as a JPEG. But do JPEGs, um, do they take up more memory if they're bigger than they need to be? Of course they do. But we're going to keep just everything 30 by 40, just so I can kind of see your format. Now, the good thing about JPEG is they use a pattern a pattern recognition algorithm to save memory. So when I save this JPEG, just like I saved all my keyframes, because all of this extra space is just white, the JPEG is really good at compressing that and not taking a whole lot of memory to remember the white. So then when we see in our downloads, just like our keyframes, our refined storyboard saved as a JPEG, and here I, I move it into my folder, and we open it up, it has the white there, but its memory is actually not that much higher. Whoops, don't want to rename it. Instead, I want to see how big it is. Its memory, which is 1.6 megabytes, right, is not that much higher than it would be if we had cropped right to the square. So go ahead and leave that extra space top and bottom. And it helps us remember that physical format is different than digital format. And if we view it 